Now we come to the end of Dallas Willard's book, Renovation of the Heart. I'm so grateful for this book. What I want to do today is to go back to the very beginning and to remind us of what this book is about. And then I'm going to go through this really, really fast. My goal is to try to summarize the high points of this book so that if you want to remember it, or you have a, fr a friend and they're kind of intimidated by reading through it, you can say, well, watch this video and this will tell you all of the highlights of Renovation of the Heart in one single telling. So it's got to be quick. Uh, here we go. Now, it starts, we live from our heart. The part of us that drives and organizes our life is not the physical. This is true even if we deny it. You have a spirit within you and it has been formed. That is, it has taken on a specific character. I have a spirit and it has been formed. This is true of everybody. The human spirit is an inescapable, fundamental aspect of every human being. And it takes on whichever character it has. Character is that general tendency to think and feel and act that gets shaped within us. We all have a character, for good or for bad. It takes on whatever character it has from the experiences and choices that we have lived through or made in our past. This is what it means for it to be formed. Our life and how we find the world now and in the future, almost totally, is a simple result of what we have become in the depths of our being, in our spirit, will, or heart. From there, we see our world and interpret reality. From there, we make our choices, break forth into action, try to change our world. We live from our depths, most of which we don't understand. Do you mean some will say that the individual and collective disasters that fill the human scene are not imposed upon us from without, that they do not just happen to us? Yes, that is what I mean, he writes. The greatest need that you and I have, the greatest need of humanity collectively, is the renovation of the heart. That is the spiritual place within us from which our outlooks and choices and actions get made. So Dallas talks about how all that God has created, he made to be intelligible, and understanding always involves a common sequence. We look at the part of any particular object, and it has certain properties that give rise to certain functions that enable it to connect or relate to other parts and form a larger whole, which has new properties and can join yet a still larger whole. So a little white or black key can be connected by a wire to a little hammer that hammers on a little string that produces a resonant sound and all that's in a box. And if you have 88 of those keys and hammers and strings, you have a piano. And then that piano can join with other instruments to perform a concerto as part of an orchestra. And then that becomes part of the canon of classical music or the world of music as a whole. And if you want to understand how um, a car works or an electrical system or an economy, that's the way that we understand it. And this is true when it comes to a person. Now, ironically, one of the great challenges in psychology, a field that I find so fascinating and important is you do not find agreement by the leading experts in the field as to what are the parts of a person. We know about the parts of a body, but part of what we all suspect and what Dallas writes about so clearly in the renovation of the heart is you are more than your body. And uh, in physics, for example, there's widespread agreement about what reality consists of until you get very, very small quarks or strings or so, or very, very large. Are we part of a universe or a multiverse? Always the search is, what are the parts and what are their properties and their functions that enable them to fit together into a larger whole? But when it comes to a person, there's great confusion about this. There is no consensus, even after over 100 years in the field of psychology, as to the parts of a person. And nobody I know lays it out as well as Dallas Willard does in Renovation of the Heart, informed by both contemporary social sciences and ancient wisdom, and especially the Bible, and especially Jesus. So uh, here are the basic parts of a person. 
to begin with, there is your will. You have a will. You have the ability to choose, to create, to say yes or no. That makes you different than any other person. That gives you dignity. Kant says that dignity is the worth that makes one human being irreplaceable. Dallas would say in the ancient world, two other words that mean basically the same function. We're talking now about the functions of a person. Two other words are spirit. Spirit is disembodied personal power. We're whipping through this stuff. Um, that, that emphasizes the fact that it's non-physical power. It, it's, it's power as gravity or electricity is, but it's not physical, it's personal. And another word generally that means the same thing as heart, when the word heart is used, it emphasizes that this is at the core of you, at the center of you. So you have a will and then you have a mind. Now you can picture these as concentric circles, but they all interact with each other, of course. And by mind, writers in the scripture and in the ancient world generally meant both your thoughts, uh, the way that things are present to your mind. Dallas says the mind consists mostly of ideas, words like democracy, equality, liberty, uh, very important assumptions about how reality works. And then images, uh, things like a piano or flag or long hair, highly emotive, mostly pictorial uh, uh entrees in our mind, and then information, facts, and then thinking, the ability to connect the dots. So your mind consists of both thoughts and then feelings. Um, and the primary feelings that we are meant to experience are love, that is to will the good and to work for the good of uh, other people, of God, of the earth, even of ourselves, enjoy a pervasive sense of well-being and peace, the rest of will that comes from an assured sense of how things will turn out. So that's at the level of the mind. And then the next layer out for you as a person is you have a body. And your body is your little power pack. It's where your kingdom begins. Your kingdom is the range of your effective will. It is the sphere in which things are the way that you want them to be. We are invited, of course, to live in the kingdom of God. The great project that Jesus was embarking on when he took on flesh was to have God's kingdom invade this world and the kingdoms of this earth. I have a kingdom, starts with my little body. You have a kingdom, starts with your little body, but our kingdoms collide, our kingdoms get infected by sin, our wills get distorted by sin. Sin gets into the members of my body. It gets into my face and my tongue and my hands and becomes habitual. And so my body, uh, which is mostly habits, most of my behavior is outsourced to my habits and tends to be driven by my appetites. My body is where my little kingdom begins. And if my um, body enslaves my will, addictions, idolatry, bad habits, I will never become the person that God wants me to be. So my body also must be brought into alignment with the kingdom of God. And then there are my relationships. No man is an island. We live in what Dallas calls in a beautiful section, circles of sufficiency. Mother and father and child, family, neighborhood, school, uh, city, nation. But all of our circles of sufficiency, our social relationships are broken and must be healed in the Trinitarian fellowship, father, son, and spirit. And then the largest layer out is the soul. You have a soul. It is not the wispy, immaterial part that lives on after you die, like Daffy Duck uh, has his little wispy part that gets rising up into the air when he's shot by an arrow. Your soul is that which integrates all the parts of you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. It is very deep. It's why we address it as though it were its own person. And when it becomes, when we become disintegrated by sin, we become a lost soul. And that is the greatest tragedy on earth. What does it profit a human being if they gain the world but lose their soul, become disintegrated so that none of the parts work? The reason why it's important to know the parts of the person are so that we can care for them properly. My friend Chuck and his brother-in-law Wade were just fixing uh, a chandelier. It was like magic to me. I couldn't understand how they did it, but they know how the wires fit together and what the bulbs do and how the electrons flow. What you, in order to care for anything, you must know the parts, and that's supremely true of persons. And now we're invited to bring our person into the kingdom of God. 
And Dallas has a little acronym about what is always required for transformation. This is true in any sphere of life. It's true for individuals as well as families and companies and nations. And it's VIM. V means I have a vision. What is your vision for who you might be in life with God? An effective vision creates unforced desire. I want that more than I want anything else. And then the I stands for intention. Now, intention is a function of the will. It is when I choose, when I say, I will have this no matter what. It's an odd fact about us that we often live as though we were not persons. Yeah, we just kind of wonder what will happen to us. Wonder if I'll really get in shape. Uh, wonder if I'll get my finances organized. Well, uh, to have a will means I can form an intention and make a decision and say, I will do these exercises, or I will devote my time to my family, or now supremely, I will follow Jesus. That is the great intention to which we are called. And then M is for means or methods. I enter into a certain way of life. I pursue certain practices. I choose to immerse my mind in wonderful thoughts from Jesus, thoughts from the scripture. That's the kind of stuff that we're doing right now. I confess my temptations, problems, sin, guilt to another person. Uh, I participate in acts of generosity. I give away some of my resources. I devote some of my time and my energy to serving other people. I engage in fellowship with those that I admire. I pursue wise means or methods. And I do all of this because the main thing God gets out of my life, your life, is the person that we become. Guys, I sat in that room in Box Canyon the first day I met Dallas, and it was amazing to me because Dallas saw God, and I saw Dallas seeing God. And I knew, and I know now, that that is worth more than anything else in the world. May God bless you as you pursue the renovation of the heart. Again, we have a group of folks that are working on uh, best of become new dot me and they will be in touch with you real soon. And I'm gonna be off for a few weeks and I look forward to my next conversation with you. Thanks so much for being part of this journey.